uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and I'm speaking to you in the background. It's a pleasure to have you all uh, on the 10th IFSO and the 6th IFSO MENA chapter webinar. This is the first joint webinar that we have between chapters and main IFSO, and we have a great and exciting topic, informed consent for bariatric surgery and specifically counseling for sleeve gastrectomy. And I'm delighted to have uh, uh, great speakers and uh, outstanding uh, expert panelists. Uh, let me introduce them one by one. Professor Alfredo Jinko from Italy, uh, Dr. Khalid Hamdan from United Arab Emirates, uh, Dr. Haysam Fawal from Lebanon, uh, Professor Musa Khurshid from Kuwait, uh, Dr. Mufazal Lakdawala from India, and uh, Dr. Richard Peterson from the, U, uh, from the United States. Just a quick comment, uh, Richard uh, was my chief resident actually during surgery, so we go way back. So, uh, pleasure to have you with us, uh, Chief. Thank you. Um, so, uh, without further ado, let's uh, start. Um, Dr. Khaled Hamdan, uh, can you uh, uh, mention your disclosures, please? Uh, yes, uh, about a third of my workload is through and wide gastric bypass, uh, half is sleep gastrectomies, so about 5 to 10% uh, revisions, uh, and I do a few balloons uh, as well uh, on the side. I've got nothing else. Sir? Yeah, yeah, in, uh, uh, in uh, all, all my experience, here's the summary of all my experience. We have been working with a team uh, of, directed by Professor Basso, where we have been performing the 42% 42, 42 of sleeve gastrectomy. Nowadays, the uh, sleeve gastrectomy is the majority operation that we perform. And the uh, and Y gastric bypass, uh, 18%. Uh, we have been performing many, many, a huge number of uh, of uh, lap band, and now this number is uh, obviously reducing. And now it's at the 21 percent in terms of percentage. Percentage uh, revision, more or less 10 percent. Uh, and uh, endoscopic procedure, endoscopic procedure about uh, the, uh, the 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 10 percent. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, about 18 percent. No, no uh, more or less. We have Thank been you. the endoscopic procedure. No worries. So uh, this is a debate, and it's actually a competition. And uh, uh, we've done it before once uh, on Ipsomina, but I'll go through it. Five questions will be presented to uh, debate on. Polls to the audience will precede each uh, answer. Um, and the uh, initial answers will be set to three minutes for each debater. Additional rebuttals will be allowed for two minutes each. And uh, afterwards, the panelists, panelists will vote on a winning answer and will ask the audience for a, a final and decisive fifth vote uh, to see who won each session. Um, our fact checker, Hasman Momani, who is in the background, and I forgot to introduce him, he'll be uh, checking on uh, uh, what we mentioned, facts, numbers, um, and uh, correct us if we make any mistakes, and hopefully on people's first language as well. Um, the audience questions will be welcomed at the end. And uh, without further ado, we'll start. Um, why are we concerned with uh, sleeve gastrectomy specifically? Uh, the recent evidence of Barrett's esophagus uh, Dr. Borghetto and Sendes mentioned the, the uh, Barrett's esophagus after sleep gastrectomy five years uh, after it to be 1.2% in their series. However, they only studied symptomatic patients and did endoscopies for symptomatic patients. Professor Jenko, as we all know, uh, studied 110 patients seven years uh, out and uh, mentioned 17% and included asymptomatic patients. And that's when the alarm started to sound. And uh, Dr. Prager and Langer uh, from Austria uh, studied their 20 patients. Three patients had Barrett's esophagus, 15%, and confirmed some asymptomatic patients. 
Professor Jinko mentioned in his um, um, following paper, uh, the uh, 19 patients. However, the incidence dropped to 13% by adding 34 patients. And then the uh, uh, multi-center trial, Se Sebastianelli and colleagues, five centers, 90 patients, 17 patients had um, uh, Barrett's esophagus, 19% uh, almost Barrett's esophagus on five years uh, follow-up. So if we um, uh, just lump uh, the uh, patient population, 485 uh, patients were studied for an 8.7% risk of Barrett's esophagus, no documented progression to dysplasia or malignancy, except for one patient who had Barrett's esophagus preoperatively already. And then the meta-analysis by Young and colleagues uh, summarized everything that we know on uh, uh, sleeve gastrectomy and meta-analysis. So we'll ask the audience first. In your practice, do you counsel patients on the risk of GERD and Barrett's esophagus after sleeve gastrectomy? And we're going to launch the first poll. Um, so meanwhile, while the uh, attendees answer, uh, I'm going to ask Professor Musa Horshi, uh, how do you counsel patients on sleep gastrectomy in your practice? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed, for uh, your question. Uh, I usually tell them that, uh, you know, you have a risk of uh, developing GERD uh, in the future in about 20% of patients. Uh, now, I do endoscopy for all my patients preoperatively. And then uh, we put them on PPIs for a period of three months following uh, sleeve gastrectomy. Now, small hiatus hernia, we do not uh, take them down. We do not bother with them, especially if the patient is asymptomatic. However, uh, those patients who are having symptoms, we always suggest that they undergo ruin y gastric bypass rather than sleeve gastrectomy. That's in brief. Great. Thank you for the quick summary. And we're going to uh, close the poll and show the results where 80% uh, said yes, they do cancel. 20% mentioned no, only GERD is a risk and uh, Barrett's esophagus should not be considered a risk. So we'll move on to the debaters. And we'll start with uh, Professor Alfredo Jenko. Do you counsel patients on the risk of Barrett's esophagus uh, and reflux after sleep in your practice? And what do you tell patients exactly? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I think that is uh, our is a mandatory to inform the patients uh, regarding the all the possible complications of all the procedures. In the case, in the in this case of sleep, we have a duty to inform the patients about the possibility uh, uh, of uh, to develop in long term uh, the uh, Barrett esophagus because uh, sleep gastrectomy is an uh, uh, induced reflux uh, operation. For this reason, I tell the patients that, that we have to manage very well to control and to cure and to control the reflux after sleep by using a proton pump inhibitor. And this may be for lifelong. Probably using a proton pump inhibitor for lifelong, the risk of Barrett esophagus and the Barrett esophagus complication will be uh, uh, avoided. I think that it is important that the patients know all this information because if it happens that some one of these patients Go, uh, develop uh, Barrett esophagus and develop dysplasia or esophageal cancer will be a big problem. We don't have to, uh, to we have to keep in our mind, oh, so sorry, probably three minutes to finish it. Oh, uh, great. Um, Khaled? Uh, yeah, yes. Um, 
Uh, thank you, Ahmed, for the kind of introduction. Uh, well, I think uh, we have two separate issues here. I'll start with GERD. Uh, I know that uh, the literature is conflicting and can be confusing at times, but uh, recent meta-analyses and systematic reviews and consensus statements uh, from the International Sleep Gastrectomy Summit in 2009 and 2012 would tell us that, yes, uh, uh, sleep gastrectomy is a refluxogenic operation. And, and because of this, I do uh, cancel all my patients about the risk of uh, uh, GERD. And if the patient uh, does have an established GERD, then I would advise them against having a uh, sleeve gastrectomy. And if they do decide to go somewhere else, then I would warn them about the risk of having persistent uh, or worsening reflux if they end up with uh, a sleeve gastrectomy. Now, if a patient doesn't have reflux, then I would offer them an, a sleeve gastrectomy, but I still warn them about uh, the 15% risk of having de novo reflux. I still offer them preoperative endoscopy because we know that uh, up to 20% of the patients will have um, uh, uh, silent reflux. Now, uh, Barrett's esophagus is a, a bit of a tricky subject to discuss. So if, if the patient is known to have established uh, 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 Barrett's esophagus, then uh, I would discuss with them an alternative procedure to sleep gastrectomy, for example, ruin my gastric bypass. 80% uh, uh, of the surgeons at the fifth uh, 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 International Sleep Gastrectomy Summit said that they would consider Barrett's esophagus as a contraindication, and the ASMBS also tells us that it's a relative contraindication. The problem that I have is with discussing the risk of Barrett's esophagus in, in sleep gastrectomy, uh, and, and I can tell you from my 12 years as an esophageal gastric cancer resectionist in the UK, having worked in a large uh, but, uh, uh, a bad screening program that we need to be really careful about providing patients with unsubstantiated information. Uh, I, I'm not against uh, talking about Barrett's esophagus, so if the patient uh, asks me about it, then I would tell them, yes, there is a link between GERD, Barrett's esophagus, and cancer. But I will also have to tell them that there is only a handful of studies linking sleep gastrectomy with Barrett's esophagus, with the risk ranging between 1.3% in uh, Braguetto's paper and 17% in Genko's paper, and the average is about 8%. But if you look at larger, more robust studies uh, about the risk of Barrett's esophagus in patients with GERD in the general population, you'll find similar figures. Uh, up to 15% of these patients will have Barrett's esophagus, and yet gastroenterological societies in Europe and in the States uh, uh, tell us to inform the patient that the risk of cancer is very small. Uh, and they go as far as telling us that we shouldn't really be doing a blanket or screening endoscopy on these patients. So I think we don't have enough inf information to uh, uh, give uh, uh, the patient all the information they need uh, uh, about the subject. So if they ask, yes, I would discuss it with them. And uh, yeah, that's really boring. So Professor Jinko, um, yeah. Uh, do you tell every patient up front that there is a risk of Barrett's esophagus? And if you do, do patients still agree on proceeding with sleeve gastrectomy in your practice? Uh, I, uh, sorry, I wanted to tell, to remark that uh, I don't know if you are able to see this slide uh, this slide, uh, sorry. Uh, 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 can you see my slide now? I'll, I'll make you the presenter shortly, Dr. Cinco. Please. Yeah. Uh, go ahead and share your screen. Do you see? Do you do you see my slide? Yes, we do. Yeah. Uh, that is uh, this is uh, endoscopy in patients with uh, after sleeve gastrectomy. And what I want to tell you that the reflux that present the patients after the sleeve is not the same reflux that the patients have before the operation. Because the reflux uh, liquid after the sleeve gastrectomy is no longer only uh, gastric juice and acid reflux, but it's a mixed reflux of juice, gastric juice, and, uh, and bile. The problem is exactly the bile, because when the bile arrives in the esophagus, can do more damages than acid alone. This is my concern, because in our experience, uh, uh, you know that we had uh, 19, uh, 17, uh, sorry, 19 patients with 
Barrett and Sophocles four years ago. At that time, the, their Barrett and Sophocles was Barrett without dysplasia. Now we have two patients on 19 with a low grade dysplasia. When the bile is present, probably the 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 proceed the the, the Barrett esophagus don't go so slowly uh, 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 to cancer. Probably the path is more more uh, more uh, uh, is uh, faster. This is my concern. And if you mention this concern to patients, do they still proceed with sleeve gastrectomy? No, no, because I think we have to, to be correct with our patients. We have just to inform they about this uh, possibility, but we have to say them more. We have to say that we have, uh, we are thinking about uh, the manner to change this very good, uh, very good operation first. Second, we have the possibility to prevent as Barrett esophagus with the medical therapy uh, uh, that we have now. And then even when Barrett esophagus go to dysplasia, if we know and we, if we detect a, 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 an early diagnosis, we have other possibility to treat and this problem even endoscopically before this uh, Barrett esophagus with low or, or mild dysplasia arrive to cancer. Khaled? Yes. Can you just go back one slide, please? Um, yes. I, I, I'm not disputing any of this. I think there is a potential risk there, but I'm disputing the quality of the data we have. I, I think we all believe that GERD is probably the, the final common pathway for the development of various osophagus. Uh, sleep gastrectomy is not an independent factor for uh, the development of various osophagus. It's through the mechanism of bile or acid reflux. Um, now, uh, my, my problem, as I said, is with the quality of the data, with the number of the patients we have, and having to discuss such a, an important topic with patients based on very, very small studies, that's where my concern is. I think to provide the patient with the full picture, you have to tell them about uh, Barrett's esophagus. You have to, have to know enough about the subject to, to be able to advise them about the risk of malignant transformation, which is very small, three in a thousand, Barrett's esophagus, and probably uh, seven in 10,000 if you have short segment Barrett's oesophagus or no intestinal metaplasia. We have to tell them that the risk of uh, oesophageal cancer is very small in the Western population, seven in 100,000. In the Middle East, having worked here for two years, I've not seen a single case, and I've scoped about four or 500 patients. And then we have to tell them that uh, survival of the patients with Barrett's oesophagus is the same as the rest of the population, and this is, has been proven. Um, now, uh, when I looked at Professor Genko's paper, which I think is a fantastic paper, it's the reason why we're having this very good debate, uh, I, I went through it with a toothpick just to try and understand uh, uh, where the data come from. And I, I found no control group to compare the patients who underwent sleep gastrectomy with. Uh, and then uh, it said that the biopsies were taken from the gastroesophageal junction. But when you look at the uh, American Gastroenterology Society, the British Society of Gastroenterologists, they insist on patients having their biopsies taken one centimeter above the gastroesophageal junction. And that's for a simple reason that you could end up with false positives if you take your biopsies from the cardia or at the gastroesophageal junction. And Professor Genko's paper also mentioned that they started measuring uh, the Barrett's oesophagus uh, from the diaphragmatic impression, which causes overdiagnosis of Barrett's oesophagus because it should really start at the proximal folds of the stomach. Uh, I'm not criticizing, this is a constructive criticism, I hope, of the paper, uh, but it also doesn't tell us about how many patients had short segment Barrett's oesophagus and how many patients had long segment Barrett's oesophagus because we know that the risk of uh, malignant transformation in patients with short segment Barrett's oesophagus is, is very, very, very small, it's negligible. So I think we need to have all this information before we uh, uh, present patients with uh, a unified opinion uh, uh, at the level of the societies that we have, gastroenterological societies, uh, because I think it's, a, it's an important topic to, to discuss with patients. It can cause anxieties, it can cause a lot of stress, and if you subject these patients to lots of endoscopies based on very little and shaky science, I think you could, uh, it's probably not cost-effective 
uh, and, and in terms of risks and benefits, uh, it hasn't pro been proven yet. So my point is that the science behind all this uh, is not very strong and, and I think we still need more studies. Great. So I'll go, just to the go back to the previous slide, Ahmed. Yeah, now uh, just very quickly here, the first slide at the top left corner, this is a clear case of Barrett's oesophagus. But if you look at the slide next to it on the right hand side, I've seen lots of people labeling this as Barrett's oesophagus, but it's not. It's just an irregular Z line and it was, it's present in about 20% of the patients. If you move down to the left, uh, again, I've seen people labeling this as Barrett's oesophagus, but that's only because the oesophagus is overinsufflated and when you suck some of the air out, you discover that it's not. Uh, Barrett's oesophagus. So that's another problem. Overdiagnosing Barrett's oesophagus uh, has been shown to be in about 30-35% of the patients. I'm not saying that Professor Genko has overdiagnosed his patients, but, but I think you know it, it's just something that the gastroenterological societies in, in Britain and America do warn endoscopists about because it generates a lot of work. Great. Thank you for this uh, elaboration, uh, Khaled. So I'll go to the panelists and we'll start with uh, Dr. Hassan Fawad. Uh, who do you think had a better point of view um, and who would you vote for and what do you do in your practice? Hassan? I guess uh, we don't have uh, Hassan. Uh, uh, so I'll go to Mufi. I think that both uh, Dr. Jinko and uh, Khaled uh, I had a point of view, but uh, what I take from uh, Alfred in his presentation that probably we, we should consent our patient about reflux and about uh, Barrett's esophagus, and we should suggest also a follow up on, a, on every, uh, every uh, after three years on a yearly basis for patients who had sleep. But I'm against this propaganda that we're having against sleep also. Uh, as Khaled mentioned, the, uh, the life expectancy is the same, whether we have Barrett's or not. And we don't have enough data to say that really we have this problem. We are operating, we are doing sleep since 20 years. We don't uh, observe this uh, problem till present. Uh, so having this propaganda against sleep, I'm against this because we have all problems with many gastric bypass, we have nutritional deficiencies, we have uh, internal hernias and hernias in the room Y. And if every surgeon will highlight only the complications of the uh, procedure that, that he don't like, probably will have a bad reputation on our practice uh, as paradigmatic surgeons, I believe. Uh, Mufi, Dr. Latawala. Uh, I agree with what Dr. Khalid says is that there are two different identities. One is GERD and one is Barrett's esophagus. I don't think anybody on this panel disagrees that we do have a problem with sleep, which is GERD. We do have increased numbers of uh, reflux rates with uh, a sleep gastrectomy, and I don't think we should debate on that. But the fact that will this GERD eventually lead to meaningful Barrett's esophagus and whether that Barrett's esophagus eventually would lead to a long-term uh, translation into esophageal malignancies, I think we have too far-fetched yet to reach to that conclusion uh, to bring disrepute to this procedure. I do agree with what uh, Dr. Jenko said as well, that you do have a mixed reflux uh, with both sleeves as well as with the uh, single anastomosis gastric bypass. And that remains a concern that what will bile eventually do to the esophagus. But that does not mean that we should uh, counsel all our patients with this risk because the risk at this point of time is very low. I think what I would do is I would counsel my patients that you will have a, have at least a 10 to 15 percent higher risk of uh, de novo reflux after a sleep gastrectomy. And if you're concerned about that, then that's probably not the procedure of choice for you. But uh, whether they're out counsel, there were Barrett's. If uh, I do counsel all my patients for a pre-op endoscopy, and that's a given in my, my uh, uh, series at least. So if a patient were to have pre-op hiatus hernia, which is uh, with grade B or plus esophagitis, and at least a, a grade three or four more uh, 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 valve defect, then I would probably not recommend a sleeve because that would eventually lead to more reflux and higher chances of Barrett's overall. So my call is that 
recommend your patients to have a, a, a higher reflux, but not uh, counsel them for Barrett's yet. Okay, Chief Richard. So um, no, I agree. Uh, I, I actually like both points of view. Uh, you know, Dr. Jenko and I actually we discussed this on our journal club right after it came out. Um, and uh, but but I but I. I, I'm interested in that data because when, when we add the patients to the to the study and we've added, you know, 34 more patients, you would have expected about five of those patients to have had Barrett's uh, if we kept up with this 19 percent. Uh, and the fact that it lowers it, I, I think, washes it out. I think Dr. Uh, you know, Hamdan's uh, information uh, that he just presented about the biopsies and whatnot, you know, that, that is a reasonable criticism. I think that's been the biggest criticism for Dr. Janko. I know he's he's heard it a million times, I'm sure now, uh, but but I think it's a warning, right? It's a definite warning light. I definitely counsel my patients about reflux uh, after the sleep, but I think it's important to, to talk about what your own data is too, uh, which is important if you're looking at your own stuff. Uh, uh, I, I don't uh, do an endoscopy on everybody postoperatively after sleep gastrectomy. Um, I do only look at those patients who are symptomatic. Um, I, I would definitely say my reflux rates after the sleep gastrectomy are not as high as 20% uh, or even 15. That doesn't mean I'm doing it better. It's just my technique is whatever it is. I, I think we all approach our, our sleeves slightly differently um, uh, and do our, you know, do our best. Uh, and certainly you can find enough data in the literature to say that actually reflux gets better after sleep gastrectomy. And there's, other, there's about the other half that say it doesn't. So I, I think that that's out there. Uh, I definitely counsel patients that it could happen, uh, but in the practice that I see, it's it's not as high. Um, and, and counseling about Barrett's, uh, I think it's and it's an important consideration. But the reality is, I don't know that um, that uh, as we've already talked about today, that the rate is so high because uh, we just haven't seen enough papers to show that that data that that number is so high. Um, and and to get to the point of what it becomes becoming a malignancy is even smaller and smaller. So that it becomes this risk becomes so low. Uh, as we go forward. So, um, but uh, yeah, I think Dr. Hamdan uh, hit this one on this first one. Great. And so, uh, Professor Portfield. You're talking oh. to me? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Your opinion on uh, the debaters. Musa? Yes, you want me to yes. comment on this? Yes, uh, I want your. Yeah, I think uh, I think. Uh, you know, I vote. That's a good About question. Who had a better opinion? Dr. Khaled. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Great. So we'll go to the audience and we'll ask them who do they, do they think had a better opinion? Who convinced you more? And meanwhile, we can ask uh, our attack checker, Hazem. Hazem, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Yes. All right. Uh, it was a really nice uh, discussion, a nice debate. I'd have to agree with both sides. I think both have had their facts correct. The panelists have made very interesting comments. All the facts and figures quoted were accurate. I only have one uh, comment about a statement made by Professor Jinko with regard to the rate of progression of Barrett's to cancer in the event of a sleep gastrectomy being faster compared to uh, the usual rate of progression for normal Barrett. This statement is unsubstantiated with any published facts or figures. Other than that, I think all the facts are accurate and correct. Thank you. Thank you, Hazem. And uh, with that, we'll close the first uh, question session and uh, share the results of the crowd and uh, one vote for Dr. Hamdan. So uh, Dr. Hamdan uh, appears to be the winner on the first segment. Now, uh, I want to mention a bias that we are uh, sometimes unaware of, which is the accent uh, that uh, Dr. Hamdan has. The British accent some, sometimes deviates 
people towards uh, your opinion. That's not fair, Ahmed. I'll change my accent now. <laughs> uh, we'll move on to the <laughs> next. I hope uh, the southern drawl that I have now doesn't dis hurt me. <laughs> so we'll move on to the next uh, question, and we'll ask the audience again. If a patient asks about uh, is um, GERD or is Barrett's esophagus preventable after sleep gastrectomy, can we do anything to prevent it? So please, uh, 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 attendees, go ahead and vote. Again, um, interested uh, to know uh, your opinion. And meanwhile, I'm uh, going to ask uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mufazal uh, Latawala, do you think GERD or Barrett's esophagus pre are preventable? Yes, I, I think uh, to a certain extent it is preventable. Uh, like uh, your second question where untwisted sleeve has a lower incidence of GRDMB, I think that's quite true. If you have a kink in the sleeve or if you have narrowing at any point of time in the sleeve, uh, then there is a and it's a lower incidence of GRD definitely. However, I do not believe the statement for where falciform ligament or Hills repair can prevent gastroesophageal reflux. I think uh, we don't have enough data there to substantiate that. Uh, these are new, relatively very new techniques. There are certain, certain surgeons who are practicing it, but in the long term, I don't uh, think we have too much of long term data for that. In uh, term of whether I would do sleeve gastrectomy in patients who have uh, symptomatic GERD, I would do an endoscopy on all these patients. And if they do have grade B or above esophagitis or have documented Barrett's, definitely I wouldn't do a sleeve. If they have a large hiatal hernia with a Hills uh, classification of three or four or above, then again, uh, C or D above, I would uh, not do a sleeve. But other than that, I think uh, maybe you can prevent it a little bit by technique, but eventually the fact of the matter remains that sleeve is a refractogenic operation and you will have uh, at least a 10% higher GRD, de novo GRD reflux after sleeve as compared to some of the other bariatric procedures we talk about. Okay, great. Thank you, Mopi. Uh, as for the uh, audience, they think is... Um, not doing uh, sleeve in patients who have GERD or esophagitis is the only way to prevent in 56 percent. Mm -hmm. However, um, you know, others, um, other techniques are mentioned as well, only three percent for the new technique. Um, so uh, I guess that follows the data. And we're um, gonna go a little bit faster as uh, I know Professor Jenko is tight in time, but I'm going to ask uh, Khaled, uh, please uh, go ahead. What do you think? Are they preventable or not? And I know you have a couple of slides, so I'll move forward. Um, uh, absolutely. I think there's so much we can do to help these patients right from the start. To my mind, just to simplify things, you know, I'm a surgeon and I like to think of things in a very simple way. There are three scenarios for the type of patients who come and see me in clinic. And I've listed them there. The, the, there are the patients with GERD, established GERD, and for these patients, right from the start, whether they have symptoms, whether without osophagitis, uh, on endoscopy, I warn them against having sleep gastrectomy. And one way of preventing this is by not giving them the option of sleep gastrectomy. Instead, uh, I uh, uh, offer them raw and wire gastric bypass. Uh, I think you kill two birds in one stone with this procedure. It's a good weight loss procedure. It's an excellent way of getting rid of reflux. We've known this for 50, 60 years now. Now, the second uh, scenario is when you get a patient who doesn't have reflux uh, symptomatically or or endoscopically, but as we all know, uh, even these patients will probably get uh, uh, some reflux post-op. Uh, and, and here, I think with these patients, I, I believe certain surgical techniques can help minimize uh, the risk of reflux. And like Dr. Peterson, I don't see very many patients with reflux in my practice, uh, so I must be doing something good. I, 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 and I hope it's one of the uh, things that I've just listed there. Uh, I, I do make sure that I dissect and resect the whole fundus uh, to uh, avoid the problem with postprandial reflux. Uh, uh, I do try and preserve the sling fibers of helvetius, so I stay away from the gastroesophageal junction by about one or two centimeters. If I do find a hiatus hernia, 
then I do repair it. Uh, uh, I avoid excessive intrathoracic dissection uh, to avoid the problem with thoracic migration of the tube. And I think Professor Genko in his paper showed uh, an average of about four centimeter migration of the tube in about 73% of the patients. Um, avoid narrowing of the tube at the incisura. This causes uh, subclinical obstruction and reflux. And also avoid too narrow a tube. Uh, 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 and another, another, another surgical technique is to make sure that the anterior surface and the posterior surface of the gastric tube are equal to minimize the problem with uh, 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 twisting and kinking. Now, for patients who have confirmed Barrett's esophagus, then I think with the data that we have, I would tend to err on the side of caution, and I wouldn't offer them a sleep gastrectomy. Instead, I would offer them a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. There is some evidence from the literature to show that the baris does regress uh, after Roux Y gastric bypass. Um, so uh, uh, post-operatively, uh, I uh, score patients uh, if they're symptomatic uh, uh, because I think it's very important to rule out anatomical problems if they do have reflux. So my threshold for scoping patients is lower than the general population. Uh, yeah. And I think we'll get to that, Khalid, on, on our next question. So uh, uh, let me, for the sake of time, go to Professor uh, Jenko. Yeah. Please. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, can you see? Sorry, can you see my picture? Um, I'll go ahead and make you the presenter. Can you see my, my picture now? Yes, we do. Uh, is an endos uh, endoscopy in a retroflexion. Are you seeing? Yes. Are you seeing? Yeah. Yes, okay. Are. This is what you do you see if you go with the scope inside the 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 sleeve gastrectomy. I am with the scope in um, in the middle of the stomach in, uh, in the corpus and I am able in retroflexion to see until the, the uh, middle esophagus okay so this is very important in order in order to in order to avoid the, the reflux to prevent to prevent the barret esophagus and reflux we have to keep I think it's very, very important to keeping the EG junction in the abdomen. Because if the, the, um, the first part, uh, the upper part, if the one third of the esophagus uh, uh, goes in the thorax, in a, a negative pressure ambient, this part of the esophagus sucks the, 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 the other, uh, Everything arrives in the esophagus, in the distal esophagus, inducing reflux. So it's very important to avoid that this EG junction migrates in the thorax. First, second, to repair, obviously, we, have, we must repair the hiatal hernia if, it's, if it is present. And uh, we must treat the patient with the proton pump inhibitor, with a high dose of a proton pump inhibitor in order to reduce not the bile reflux, because using a proton pump inhibitor, we are not able to do this. But we have to reduce the proton, uh, to reduce the gastric acid reflux, because reducing the acid in the stomach, we are able to induce the, the bile to uh, the bile to induce less damages. This is what we can do. And then very close follow up, not evaluating the symptoms alone. Because the, as I demonstrated with the, the last Aguar paper, there is no correlation between symptoms and the esophageal lesions. Great. And uh, uh, Khaled, do you want to uh, comment? Uh, yes, I, I, I think uh, uh, it's a case of getting it right from the start. I think. Uh, uh, taking the right decision right from the start about which patient gets sleeve and which patient gets uh, 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 Roux-en-Y gastric bypass or anastomosis is very, very crucial. 
I think it was, uh, I recall a study that uh, when they introduced endoscopies and, and started investigating, investigating patients carefully, they managed to reduce their conversion rate. Uh, and I'll talk about this later. Uh, but I think a combination of making the right decision about the type of surgery that, that is suitable for a particular patient, and also when you do a sleeve, make sure that you uh, 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 make sure that your technique is geared towards uh, 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 minimizing any any problems with reflux, whether it is vascular migration, repairing the hydrocells, or all the things that Professor Jekyll and I have talked about. Uh, so these are the two things: right decision, right type of surgery, and if you do the surgery, do it properly. I think. Mean, Dr. Jinkle. Yeah. Uh, sorry. I, I. This is what I think that this is what we have to avoid. I hope you are able to see the, my 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 slide. Do you see this slide? Yes, we do. This is what we have to avoid. This is what we have to avoid. I say my patients, uh, I, I inform my patients regarding the, the risk of reflux, but I say my patients, sleeve gastrectomy is a very effective procedure. Our patients, 10 years after the sleeve, they stay, uh, they have 14 point of BMI less than the starting point. And this is very important. But we have to, to work together in order to avoid what this picture is showing you. Great, thank you. And I'll go to the panelists now. And I think we have a, an almost an agreement between the two debaters, uh, but we'll start with the chief, uh, Richard. Yeah. What do you uh, think? So, go ahead. Yeah, what, what do you think uh, about the opinion of both uh, debaters? Well, I, you know, Amara, I totally agree with you. Um, I think both uh, both of you had some very si similar uh, uh, thoughts on the, on this process. So um, I, I would agree. Someone who comes in and has bad reflux to start with, uh, that's not someone I offer a sleeve to. I just don't think I'm going to make them better. Uh, I think the, the ruin Y gastric bypass is the right operation for those patients. Uh, you know, it's one of those your curative things that we see uh, in essence. And um, so I think that's the right way to go. Um, so overall, I think again, both 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 uh, debaters had good points on this one. Uh, I, it'd be hard for me to pick either one because I think you both have relevant comments that were actually um, uh, uh, similar to one another. So yeah, I think it's almost a, a tie. Uh, Hassan, yeah. what do you think? Yes. Uh, uh, also, I agree with both. Uh, first, uh, uh, patient selection is the key to see uh, which patient will do a sleeve and for which patient I got to do a bypass. Second, consenting of the patient, explaining the risk of uh, uh, reflux and probably uh, if we have enough data to talk about Barrett's. And uh, third, uh, uh, surveillance, endoscopic surveillance. And fourth, avoid propaganda on uh, really Barrett's and sleeve till we have enough evidence to talk about. Uh, Professor Musa, Rashid. Uh, I, I think uh, to answer your second question, can we avoid Jared and uh, uh, <clears throat> Barrett esophagus? Uh, I think it's so much related to the technique that we use. Uh, how do we do it? And I think Dr. Khalid have mentioned that very clearly in his slides, and uh, how uh, we should do our sleeve you will find out that many people who are doing uh, the sleeve gastrectomy uh, probably do it in different ways and in different techniques. E even among us as uh, panelists, we do it differently. Uh, there are certain basic uh, principles in terms of uh, uh, how we handle hiatus hernia. Uh, many of our patients in the Middle East insist to uh, have a, a sleeve gastrectomy rather than Brunoy gastric bypass. They think it's a major procedure and it is associated with many problems. So we have to deal with uh, such issue and then we have to do different ways of handling the hiatus hernia. We always re recommend though patients with a preoperative reflux 
we uh, uh, advise them to undergo uh, Ruhnwein gastric bypass uh, or mini bypass, which is becoming much more popular now. Uh, and uh, uh, and then uh, we avoid the sleeve gastrectomy. If we have to do it, then we have to repair the hiatus. And in many cases, we don't have data about this and follow up. We use the fossiform ligament technique to wrap the lower end of the esophagus. Thank you. Can I have a small comment, Ahmed, just uh, on the issue of repairing the hiatus? Can I? Please, go ahead. Um, uh, uh, Musa, we have two control trials, one by Scott Chikora, and uh, both showed that uh, repairing the hiatus will not decrease the reflux in patients with sleep. So if we are going to repair it, just to repair the hiatus to avoid the migration of the sleep. So if we have a large hiatus, yes, I would go and dissect and uh, repair the hiatus. If not, probably it is not advised to disrupt the anti-reflux mechanism already present. And uh, I already uh, launched the poll to the audience, and we'll see what the audience uh, uh, say. Uh, I mean, th there are too many uh, conflicting data as far as preventing GERD technically with hiatohernia, with additional procedures, that there are no long-term uh, uh, data. But I'll go to Hazem on this, and uh, he'll uh, make us right. Uh, thanks, Ahmed. I think you've just said what I was about to say. All the techniques that have been uh, mentioned by the panelists and the two speakers have been described in the literature. We don't have any long-term data to support uh, any of them. As uh, Mr. Haytham, Dr. Haytham has just said, we can repair the hiatus hernia that will avoid migration. However, we know there's not always an association between the migration and the reflux. So to sum it up, the falciform repair wrap and the house repair are experimental and could not be advocated. All other techniques described by the speakers have been uh, advocated, but still we don't know what is the magic bullet that should make us avoid reflux after uh, a sleeve gastrectomy. So, um, I think the British accent is actually working just fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, 62% still think uh, despite the panelists saying it's a tie, um, we'll go with uh, Dr. Khalid Hamdan on uh, this one as well. So we'll move to the next uh, poll. The audience, is there a role for endoscopy before and after uh, uh, sleep, but mainly after, in your informed consent? And uh, I'm going to ask Haysan, what, what, what do you think on, on this issue? Do you counsel patients that they must have post-operative endoscopy in your practice? Uh, Haysan, can you hear us? Sorry, Ahmed, uh, I was muted. Um, uh, since we don't have enough data at present to support doing a routine endoscopy, and as you know, we have problems with insurance companies also to approve doing it. So I'm doing only for symptomatic patients the pre-op endoscopy. However, I insist on all my patients post leave to start doing uh, elective uh, <clears throat> and uh, surveillance endoscopy uh, on a yearly basis after the third year. Okay, great. And the audience say uh, mandatory pre-op but selective post-op for symptomatic patients in majority. However, 24% do agree with uh, ISAM on mandatory pre-op and post-op routinely. ISAM, you do it uh, three years onwards, which I think is uh, probably a good time to start. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll go with uh, Professor Jinko. Uh, yeah. What do you do in your practice uh, as far as post-operative endoscopy? And I think we all know, but how frequent do you do it and what is your routine? Now, regarding, uh, sorry, um, regarding, regarding the pre 
operative endoscopy, the importance of the preoperative endoscopy. Let me to show you, um, sorry, to show you this slide. Sorry, <coughs> to show you this slide. Uh, I hope you are able, are, are you able to see my, my? Yes, we do. Are you able? Okay, so, so this is an example of uh, what we, why we have to do endoscopy uh, always, always, because here you can see a case of uh, a female, 50 years old, who presented the lower esophageal adenocarcinoma three years after complicated this living gastrectomy with the known preoperative Barrett esophagus without dysplasia detected by gastroscopy before the sleeve. A multidisciplinary decision suggested the treatment by endoscopic mucosectomy. And th this is the results. Okay, uh, this is one of the reasons why we have to do endoscopy uh, before. Oh, here there is, uh, sorry, there is uh, another example. Sorry. And uh, this is uh, a patient. Can you see? Uh, sorry. Uh, can you see this slide now? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Uh, patients with uh, endoscopy negative for Barrett before, before, um, uh, sorry, before the sleeve. the sleeve, sorry, before the sleeve and uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> And this is the results only only five years after the sleeve. Okay? Uh, patients without esophagitis, patients without Barrett before sleeve gastrectomy. From sleeve gastrectomy, from the operation passed only five years. This is the reason why we have to perform a very close follow-up, not only taking care of the symptoms, but performing gastroscopy in order to see very well what happened in the terminal, the last part, the last end of the esophagus. Because the symptoms, the symptoms doesn't, symptoms don't tell us anything about the situ esophageal situation. This is my opinion. Okay, uh, Khaled? Uh, yes. Um, well, I'm, I'm quite clear in my mind about what I should do uh, preoperatively. I think all patients should have uh, preoperative endoscopy, although the uh, literature is conflicting and confusing about this. Uh, uh, some of the literature tell, tells you that the pickup rate is quite significant. You should do it on everyone. And uh, uh, for every study that tells you this, you'll find another study that tells you, look, the pickup rate is negligible and 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 then uh, you know you'll be doing hundreds and hundreds of endoscopies without picking up anything now the asmb guidelines tells you that you should be selective with your preoperative endoscopy i think uh, it will show that in one to nine percent of the patients you will alter your decision uh, the efso guidelines tell you that you should do it routinely not selectively like the asmbs i personally as i said think that uh, it's a very useful diagnostic tool uh, not because I'm worried about these very rare conditions such as gastric cancer, oesophageal cancer, uh, but, but more about the common pathologies such as hernias, oesophagitis, uh, and, and even in asymptomatic patients, I think 20% of our patients will have silent reflux, that is, oesophagitis, without symptoms. Uh, and without endoscopy, it's very difficult 
uh, to really know which one has grade C or D osophagitis, in which case you won't offer them sleep gastrectomy, and which patient has grade A. So yes, I'm all in favor of preoperative endoscopy. I think postoperative endoscopy is a completely different kettle of fish, and I don't think we have any data to support uh, doing it routinely. The ASMBS didn't issue any guidelines about uh, doing it routinely, while the EFSO recommendations uh, uh, recommend uh, endoscopy at one year, three years, five years, and then 10 yearly after that, more frequently if the patient has reflux. And I honestly think, and I'm not going to sit on the fence here, I think this is an overkill. Uh, I don't think anyone looked at the risk and benefits of doing this. The uh, British Society of Gastroenterologists, the American societies, uh, have, have even advised against doing uh, routine endoscopy, screening endoscopy on GERD patients in the general population. And they only issued a weak recommendation, that is grade C recommendation for screening patients with GERD who have other risk factors, such as being white, male, greater than the age of 50, or being obese with a family history of cancer. We are being asked to uh, uh, exercise restraint about uh, dishing out endoscopies willy-nilly on patients uh, 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 just because we think that there is a risk. Uh, so post-operatively, I'm selective. Uh, Pre-operatively, I'd, I'd, I'd do it on all patients. Okay, so I think we're clear on uh, both the Bayer's uh, position. But I'm, uh, I'm going to ask the panelists and Professor uh, Musa Khorshid, who would you go with as far as uh, each opinion? And uh, do you think we need to do it for the sake of data for future patients? Preoperative endoscopy. Uh, no, uh, postoperative endoscopy. Preoperative endoscopy, I think everyone agrees that we should get it, but postoperative endoscopy. I, I think, yes. Uh, I think after a year, it uh, should be done, especially with patients. Uh, after sleep, we should do it on annual basis. Uh, from the reports that we are see, seeing from our experience with our patients, we see that uh, you know uh, a number of patients develop de novo reflux, and those pa patients uh, would would require uh, an annual endoscopy to make sure that they do not develop Barrett esophagus. If we have a Barrett esophagus then we, we need to do an annual screening and follow-up of those patients and take biopsy. Uh, but uh, as has been mentioned before also, that we have to be careful in the definition of Barrett esophagus. How do we take the biopsies, as Dr. Khalid has mentioned? And many of those patients in the Middle East, we literally don't see Barrett esophagus. I don't know. I've worked in Europe, I worked, uh, I've seen in North America, the incidence is much higher than what we see in the Middle East. And that is a point that has to be taken into consideration when we discuss this issue. Thank you. Mofi, thank you, Professor Forsi. Uh, we've already published uh, the, the fact that it is mandatory to do pre-op endoscopies, not only for picking up GERT and reflux, but also for picking up silent tumors. Let's say you were to do a RUA Y or any form of bypass in terms of GIST or NET tumors and various other things. I'll come to post-operative endoscopy. I think I would like to put bariatric surgery in its analogy because it's a chronic uh, management. It's a management of a chronic disease. I would put this analogy close to, uh, let's say, oncology. All of our patients with uh, cancer surgeries, we do ask them for mandatory follow-ups, right? You ask them to do a yearly PET study or uh, ultrasounds or various CT scans or various other things. So why not do an endoscopy on some of our bariatric patients, especially when we do know that there is a high incidence of asymptomatic uh, uh, problems that can happen to a lot of these patients. For example, asymptomatic uh, reflux and leading to Barrett's in some of our slave patients. Uh, why would we want to wait only till Professor Jenko showed uh, to a point where it le led to a cancer? Why would we not pick it up earlier? Uh, asymptomatic ma uh, marginal ulcers which are present in rheum gastric bypass. So we need to be more scared of the asymptomatic patients rather than the symptomatic patients because this is um, uh, a technique of surgery we are doing for a chronic uh, patient. Great. Yeah? Uh, 
Richard? So, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm in that group of people. I do pre-op endoscopy on every patient. Um, uh, what I'll tell you, though, is, uh, and, and it has changed my practice uh, and changed my, my surgery that I'm going to offer the patient. So I think it's critical. Uh, the problem, as we've already kind of highlighted, is the post-op uh, surveillance. And the reality is, if there are no symptoms, uh, and it's the asymptomatic ones that, you know, we're, we're kind of looking at, um, if there's no symptoms, I'm not going to get insurance to cover it. And uh, this, that's a big expense for patients. So uh, so that's, a, that's something to consider. So uh, pre-op endoscopy, I think, is really critical. And uh, I'm definitely scoping patients post-operatively that have symptoms. Um, but it would be nice to get a larger, uh, you know, set of data to look at all patients and see what that really uh, shakes out after the sleep. So if uh, insurance was not an issue, you would get post-operative routine endoscopy? Um, if insurance wasn't an issue and patients consented for it, I, I would not have a problem. I mean, it's a, in, in essence, a, a relatively benign procedure. Uh, it's not without risk, of course. Um, but uh, I think it would be helpful to get the data, just like we all used to do upper GIs post-operatively, right? We did it forever. Everybody got it. Everybody got it. And you realize, you know, it really wasn't helping you. Uh, and if the really, if the data shaked out uh, or shook out that it was a real small percentage of patients that we weren't, and the screening wasn't beneficial uh, post-operatively, then, then I would probably stop. Uh, but, but right now, I, th I think our data is just so, um, it's, it's not strong enough uh, for us to make a, a conclusion uh, one way or the other. So... Majority um, uh, of the panelists actually voted for Dr. Uh, Jenko uh, on routine endoscopy. And Haysom, you mentioned that you do. And uh, I'm going to close the audience poll and share the results. Despite the, the audience agrees with Dr. Khaled Hamdan on selective postoperative endoscopy, Haysom, what, what, what do you have to tell us? Uh, I think you guys have summarized it really well. If, if, if people don't mind, I'll re-quote uh, Dr. Richard's uh, statement. Uh, there isn't enough evidence published out there to support uh, post-operative surveillance, quote unquote, after sleep gastrectomy. I think the future will be different, but for now, all the recommendations are published by society based on minimal evidence and it's just peer review opinions. Uh, I think the future will be different, but for now, I'd agree with everything you guys have said. Thank you. Uh, Ahmed, uh, this might be out of protocol, Ahmed. Uh, well, I don't know whether I can have 10, 15 seconds of rebuttal here. <laughs> <laughs> for, the sake, for the sake of time, I think uh, just include your rebuttal in the next uh, question. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, just for the sake of time, Dr. Jenko, are you okay on time? Yeah, okay. So we'll ask the audience, do you counsel patients on weight regain? And that's a separate issue after sleeve gastrectomy. So um, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Professor uh, Musa, um, do you counsel patients on weight regain? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we see many patients for so we do revisional bariatric procedure for uh, uh, reasons, failure of weight loss or regain of weight or complications. And many uh, of our procedures that we do now is due to complications after sleeve gastrectomy. We see a lot of kinks, twists, uh, hiatus hernias, reflux, etc. Uh, not much on weight regain. Uh, they lose a quite a good num uh, amount of weight and we've done a uh, number of studies on this and we compared our results to uh, Ruinwai gastric bypass. However, we see uh, uh, quite a number of uh, those complications and that's why uh, we convert them to either uh, Ruinwai gastric bypass or to mini gastric bypass, which is uh, gaining much more uh, popularity. I know that uh, people are more uh, keen to do Roux-en-Y gastric bypass than mini bypass or one anastomosis gastric bypass in those patients uh, who are having GERD uh, following sleeve gastrectomy. But we have, in our humble experience, we have seen uh, very good results and resolution of uh, symptoms following 
repair of hiatus hernia and uh, mini gastric bypass. Great, thank you. Thank you. And uh, um, the audience does uh, counsel patients routinely on regain after sleeve gastrectomy. Yes, and um, I'll go to the debaters. And um, Khaled? Uh, yes, uh, definitely, I do. Um, uh, I, I think, uh, it, you know, talking about uh, or discussing weight regain after uh, uh, sleeve gastrectomy or any type of surgery is the responsibility of the multidisciplinary team as a well, whole, not just the surgeon. Uh, uh, now, uh, I, I don't counsel them about it because uh, I want the people just to know about it. I think it's part of an informed consent, fully informed consent, to uh, uh, tell the patient about weight regain. And it's also an opportunity to educate patients about weight regain and how to avoid it or minimize it. I don't think you can fully avoid it. Um, now, when you read the literature, you, you'll come across two problems. The first is that th there isn't a, a, a widely accepted definition of what should constitute weight regain. You have six or seven different uh, definitions. I think Luti, when I looked at his paper in 2017, he applied the six different definitions of what should constitute weight regain, and he ended up with different results. Um, now, uh, it, it's... it's uh, uh, yes, there are certain things you can do to minimize weight regain, but uh, uh, ultimately, uh, uh, you know, you will, your patients will probably suffer from weight regain. Do I still have a few seconds there? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, now, if you look at the meta-analysis, especially the, uh, 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 the one that showed 28% uh, weight regain that this paper was published in 2017, and the most recent paper for BAIC from the Indian database, uh, weight regain after sleeve gastrectomy was 34%, uh, ruin wide gastric bypass is 14%. Uh, so yes, you get more weight regain after sleeve gastrectomy, but the study was very, very small. Um, and, and I think uh, with a combination of good surgical technique, educating patients, counseling patients about the problem, and also close follow-up, we might see better results uh, in the long term. But I do counsel all my patients about weight regain, and I take the issue very seriously with them. Great. Thank you, Khaled. Uh, Professor Jinko? Yeah. Obviously, inform the patients regarding the, the unsuccess of the, about the regain is mandatory, of, of course. Um, and uh, we inform the patients that uh, the regain, when it is an important regain, uh, can affect the uh, gastroesophageal reflux. And um, uh, I think that the problem of regain is a, a very important problem uh, because uh, uh, a, a that problem is not a problem of the, of the team, it's a problem regarding the, 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 the surgeon because sometimes the regain is not due to, uh, to the, the multidisciplinary team, but sometimes the regain is due to, uh, to, to uh, uh, the, the, to the choice of performing a restrictive, um, even metabolic procedure in a patient with a serious alteration of alimentary behavior. And uh, we must inform our patients because uh, 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 we have to say that anyway, that first, the regain is a, a rare complication. Because in our experience, we have uh, a regain of more than 10 kilograms only in uh, in the in the 18 percent of our, of our patients. The regain is rare, and we have to inform the patients that even when this happens, we have the second possibility, changing uh, 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 procedure, but submitting the patients to another surgical procedure. This is mandatory, I think. Great. Um, and for the sake of time, I'll go to the panelists. Mufi, uh, I, I guess both uh, panelists agree on counseling patients on weight regain. Um, what do you do in your practice, and do you agree with uh, both panelists, uh, debaters? 
I think both the panelists have done a great job because I think as bariatric surgeons, we need to counsel our patients that almost all pre all procedures, which is the standard procedures like the RUAMI, the single anastomosis gastric bypass, all the sleeve gastrectomy, all have a chance of weight regain. Depending on the patient follow-up, we have the various degrees of weight regain. However, what we do need to understand is compared to the other, other two standard procedures, the single anastomosis or the RUAMI, the sleeve has the highest chance of weight regain. Uh, whether we need to counsel our patients about this, I think we should tell all our patients that a procedure is only a tool and it can be used as well as he would want it to. That's what my take is. Great point. Uh, Richard? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I definitely, I do counsel my patients that uh, there is uh, compared, because I do the bypass and I do the sleeve, I don't have a third uh, uh, armamentarium uh, tool. So uh, I counsel them that there is a higher chance of weight regain after a sleeve as compared to the bypass, but that's just purely, that's just, you know, averages. Uh, and patients do well um, when they use the tool appropriately. And every one of them I counsel um, for a long period of time that they have a chronic disease. And that's what they need to understand that this disease, it's not just no one single tool can cure their disease. Um, it's, it's a lifelong process. So I think that's important. Um, and that is a great point uh, that you raise. Uh, and I sometimes wonder if uh, some uh, procedures are limited with uh, reversing the physiology of the disease. Hi, Sam. Uh, I know this is a sensitive issue uh, on sleep, weight regain, and uh, Ron why we debated this a lot, but what's your opinion? Yes, uh, definitely. I don't see my patient. I explained that uh, obesity is a genetic uh, disorder and a complex disorder that is not solved by our surgery, that they will have a 25 to 50 percent chance of weight regain. And I second further in uh, comparing obesity to cancer. So patients should understand that they should, should have a neoadjuvant treatment, probably a surgical treatment, and, <laughs> and uh, that uh, the expectations uh, are not 100% uh, uh, success, that we have 25 to 50% chance of weight regain with fine. And I already launched the poll. I think both panelists, uh, both debaters are in agreement and the panelists think that uh, this is a tie. Let's see what the audience says. And meanwhile, we'll go to Hazem. Hazem, well, how did we do? Thanks, Ahmad. I think uh, all the facts quoted have been accurate. The Amongst of all bariatric surgeries available, the highest uh, rate of weight regain is amongst patients who've had sleep gastrectomy. I only have one comment about a statement made by Professor Musa about uh, talking about their experience of uh, using the mini bypass or the one anastomosis gastric bypass to treat reflux uh, following a sleeve, sleeve gastrectomies. Uh, this statement is based probably on their own experience. We need uh, larger data, or larger studies to uh, to support such, such, such statement. For the time being, the recommended treatment for reflux after sleeve is to consider the usual rule and why configuration. Yes, I think that's what he mentioned, but he mentioned that uh, others do it. And uh, yeah, okay, okay, excuse me, sorry. No, no worries. Yeah, okay. uh, and uh, I guess the audience uh, is biased towards uh, Dr. Hamdan for some <laughs> reason. Uh, I bet it's the accent. And uh, <laughs> So it's uh, well, an Italian, Italian accent, uh, Ahmed. I think no. a lot of people find it sexier. Uh, <laughs> I bet. Uh, and we've come to the last uh, philosophical question. And, uh, <laughs> and it's really uh, something completely difficult to do. And uh, we'll, we'll poll the audience on this. But can we actually minimize the personal bias? Because I'm pretty sure if you don't do ruin y gastric bypass and you counsel your patients on sleeves, your informed consent will be different than somebody who prefers ruin y gastric bypass. And uh, uh, Chief, I know you like these topics, and I'll go with you. What, what do you what do you think? 
Yeah, I think it's a, I, I, you made a really good point. Um, I think it is hard to take out your personal bias um, and uh, list it on those quick, the quick full questions. I mean, I think if one person or if a person's doing primarily only one operation, I think that they're gonna be biased about talking about that. Uh, clearly when the band surgeries were just being done, uh, band fixed everything for those surgeons who only did bands. Um, you know, and in my review, I do the, I go around to the accredited centers for evaluation in the US um, and look at them. And, and when I come across some of the programs are doing 95 or 100% sleeves, uh, you know, what, what are they really counseling uh, their patients? So, uh, and it's also hard to take out our personal bias of our own experience within the, you know, within our surgical population that we uh, operate on. So I think it is important that we be as clear about uh, the, in the informed consent process, but I do think it's hard. I think it's hard, even if you're doing a 50-50, I still think it's hard for you to remove a personal bias just based on our own experience. But I, I do my best. I just don't know if it's uh, if what I do is is exactly right. And I'm curious what other people think. So the audience uh, uses uh, um, fifty percent of the audience use a unified written consent. I was wondering if anyone used a unified video consent. And uh, twenty five percent of uh, the surgeons say it's uh, difficult for volume sleep surgeons, and nineteen percent it's impossible. And I wonder how the 6% exclude themselves from counseling uh, or uh, the procedure selection. And uh, with that, I'll go to the debaters and we'll start with Professor Jenko. Yeah, I, I think it's, that it's almost impossible to, uh, uh, to avoid, to influence, uh, influence the patients even when uh, the doctor is an objective doctor and try to do uh, his best uh, to work in his best uh, best manner anyway we have uh, an informed consent for each procedure and we report in this uh, in this uh, consent uh, um, all uh, uh, the, the the summary of of the literature with the in very easy manner and uh, in order to try to inform the patients very, very well. And uh, I think that our opinion, our opinion of the surgeon is, uh, is, is, is important. And I think that very often we influence the patients, even if we, if we uh, uh, show them all the possibility, all the procedure we can perform. I think that, uh, 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 will be almost impossible to to avoid to the to influence the patients under hundred percent. Thank you, Professor Ginko. Uh, Khaled. Yes, I agree with uh, Richard and Professor Jenko on on this. Uh, I think no matter how well intentioned we are uh, with the patient's care at the center of everything we do, uh, I think it's very difficult not uh, to be under the influence of uh, some personal bias. Uh, and, and as you said at the beginning, it's a, a philosophical thing. I think our beliefs are, uh, are uh, influenced uh, by uh, a lot of things that we are subconsciously uh, probably not aware of. For example, we were where we were trained, when we were trained, and by whom we were trained. Uh, I, I think uh, I am personally uh, probably a little bit biased towards ruin white gastric bypass because I was trained to do the procedure in the United Kingdom uh, when it was very popular by someone. My mentor was uh, pro ruin y gastric bypass. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I think uh, uh, the two issues that we really need to think about when we cancel patients and consent them for a particular procedure is to think of two issues. Uh, how do we obtain a well-informed consent and how do we give the patient or preserve the patient's autonomy? Uh, uh, getting a well-informed consent means that we really need to avoid informational bias and all sorts of biases. And we do this sometimes subconsciously, as I said. You know, we uh, mention certain information and we leave out uh, others or we emphasize uh, bits of information and we don't emphasize other bits of information. And, and, and we try and get the patient to agree to what we believe in. Um, and and I, I don't know rightly or wrongly, but I do... Uh, 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 try and do a few things during my clinic. For example, I ask for a second opinion when I feel that the patient is hesitating 
at the risk of maybe losing the patient. Uh, I do ask the patient to come back uh, for another visit uh, to my clinic if I feel that uh, the, the, the consultation is not going the way I want it to. Uh, also trying to practice evidence-based science and align <coughs> with, uh, with major societies and, and, uh, and bodies is another way of minimizing that bias. But I don't think we'll be able to get rid of it 100%. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jinko, do you have any other uh, comments? No, no thanks. Oh, great. So, um, Haysam, I'll start with you. Uh, yes. Uh, how do you try to minimize the bias in your practice? I think it is very difficult, as Khaled says. I know we are all uh, probably trained to do to prefer a procedure over, the, uh, over another procedure. And even if we have a unified consent, still, you know, we surgeons are sometimes cheaters, so we can introduce the information the way we want to introduce it to the patient. And uh, at the end of the day, it is very difficult. So probably having an independent uh, a person who do the consent form, like the bariatric specialist or uh, obesity specialist, I think this uh, may decrease the, the bias in consenting the patient on uh, our procedures. Uh, Professor Musa? It's a very good question, actually, but uh, you're addressing it to the panelists who know many procedures. They, they do the bypasses, all kinds, the sleeves, etc. So we don't have this problem of being biased because we, we do all those procedures. And we would advise the patients according to the evidence-based medicine. The question should be addressed to the junior staff who just have learned how to do the bariatric procedures. And those are the, uh, those doctors who are just starting to do the sleeves. They would come and tell the patients that the sleeve gastrectomy is the best procedure in terms of outcomes, weight loss, etc., etc., It's simple in terms of complication and so on. So why now, if you look, the majority of people are doing sleeves. 60% of bariatric procedures are sleeve. Yet, in previous comments that we heard from the panelists that the outcomes of bypass, ruin y bypass, in terms of weight loss, is far much better than the sleeve gastrectomy. So why people are doing more sleeve? That is the question that we have to address. And that is the thing that we have to ask the junior staff. They have to know how to do the bypasses. They have to know, know how to do the different bariatric procedures and not to stick to only one procedure, which is a sleeve gastrectomy. And that's my humble opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Musa. Mufi, I know you're a big IFSO and a previous president of the Asian Pacific chapter. Have you ever thought about having IFSO do a uniform informed consent? Uh, I mean, like you first said, this is uh, philosophical and we as human beings are prone to subconscious bias. All of us are. So it's a rhetoric question. Uh, you should ask this question more to inventors of procedures. They become almost stakeholders. So you would ask someone who proposes a sleeve gastrectomy for all comers or proposes a single anastomosis gastric bypass to all comers. I mean, there is a bias in what they do. So subconsciously, we always tend to prefer a procedure which we think could be a better procedure for our patients, irrespective of what sometimes the data uh, says. So we are just humans. I think uh, we need to come down to basically figuring out whether which is the best procedure for our patients only based on literature based guidelines but then sometimes uh, facts are proven completely wrong in longer term data so uh, for example i will tell you that at one point of time we believed that the ruamai gastric bypass was the procedure for all comers right today we don't necessarily believe that is true so sometimes we, we think about something and 10 years later are proven completely wrong. So I think bias is going to be part and parcel of what we do and how we practice, and we're never going to be able to remove it. Thank you. And, uh, you know, the poll is ongoing and uh, only 33%. So I urge the audience to vote. Uh, uh, Chief, 
you have any comments on, you know, approaching maybe ASMBS on a uniform uh, informed consent? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's a good point, Ahmad. Uh, I mean, uh, giving uh, having something that's a that has the data, uh, you know, uh, included in it. Uh, may talk about regain, but that uniform consent, I think, is I think it would be helpful. Maybe it helps some of us remove our personal bias if we follow those uh, considerations. Uh, I think one of the concerns clearly uh, is kind of already uh, mentioned by uh, Dr. Kursheed is that, um, you know, in the United States, our fellowship training, a majority of uh, folks are actually, um, you know, their fellowships, a, a big part of them are just sleeves. Uh, we have people who are forgetting how to do, um, you know, the gastric bypass. Uh, and that's kind of an interesting, you know, thought when you think about that. Um, it, so it's an easier operation, it's done quickly uh, for a lot of folks and easy doesn't always mean better, right? So, uh, but a uniform consent would be, I think, helpful. Um, and it would help those who don't do all the operations uh, provide at least, I think, a level uh, of, of uh, consent across the board for, for their operations. Great, and the uh, audience still thinks Dr. Hamdan is a winner. <laughs> uh, I guess the uh, British accent today uh, won. I, I think we are all winners. I'm uh, privileged and honored <laughs> to have you all. Uh, and I would like the debaters to uh, please close with the uh, final remark. Uh, after Hazem, uh, tell us if we did okay or not. You, I know there's no you, data. You did, you did okay. There's no data, but I've, I've seems to have cracked the reason why Khalid had seemed to have won all the debates. It's his birthday today, so happy birthday, Khalid. <laughs> oh, wow. Happy birthday. So th there's your gift from Ipso. Yes, yes. Yeah. I've just found out now. I've just found out now. So I'll never, that's ever it from my side. <laughs> Closing uh, remarks, uh, Professor Jinko, um, can you summarize your thoughts, please? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, let me first of all to thank you, to thank uh, uh, IFSO Society for taking care, taking care of, of this topic of this problem because uh, this is an important problem, and our duty, the duty of the scientific community. Uh, uh, is uh, to discuss, to evaluate, to measure the problem, okay? To induce uh, and promote, uh, to promote, uh, um, to promote, sorry, uh, scientific studies in order to understand how much this problem is a huge and a really problem. Because up to now we have just three papers demonstrating the, uh, the the Barrett esophagus but we need to, in order to have a good uh, opinion we need to involve more and more patients so i hope that uh, in the future um, uh, more uh, studies with a, a, a greater a huge number of patients will be performed up to now i think that uh, uh, living gastrectomy may be may induce in the future a disaster only because only doing this easy consideration even if the the prevalence of barrett esophagus after sleeve is the 8.7 percent this 8.7 percent is 8.7 percent of a thousand and a thousand of sleeve gastrectomy we are performing all over the place in the world. So I think that our duty is, is to study how we can change the, 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 the technical procedure in order to avoid the re isophagia reflux. I want to remind you that Barama Budaye, the, a good gastroenterologist from Mayo Clinic that uh, have been performing the ESG endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. Uh, uh, he has demonstrated that the ESG, that as you know, maintaining the fundus in this, uh, uh, intact, 
In this patient submitted to endoscopic is delivered gastroplasty, the uh, level of ghrelin is uh, reduced more or less uh, like in patients submitted to uh, 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 surgical, surgical sleeve. So we have to change the technique, even maintaining the his angle there, and we don't have to, to worry about the ghrelin level. Uh, I hope that in the future many studies will be performed and uh, because we, I think, let me to close showing my last, my last slide that, uh, are you able to see my last slide? Yes. One second, uh, Professor Ginko, I think uh, it's coming now. Albert Einstein said, the measure of intelligence is given by the ability to change when needed. This is my opinion. Great, thank you. Uh, those are all uh, great points that you raised, uh, Professor Jinko, and I think we need more data and uh, we need to follow patients long-term, as you said. Uh, Khaled? Uh, yes, I mean, my biggest concern about sleep gastrectomy is weight regain. Not so much about its autophagus. Uh, and again, I'm not going to sit on the fence on this one. I don't think we need to wait for another 10 or 20 years before we know whether Barrett's autophagus is a major problem with sleep or not. I think the data is all there. Uh, we have a similar group of patients uh, uh, in, uh, in the UK and in the Netherlands and in in the States with similar risk profiles. Uh, these patients have very high incidence of reflux. These are the obese patients, the male patients greater than 50. And I think there is a wealth of data there uh, that we can uh, 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 you know, benefit from. Uh, and I think we need to join effort with other gastroenterological societies to really tackle this problem. I'm not dismissing Barrett's as being uh, a trivial problem in in, in sleep gastrectomy, but I I, I am you know I, I always insist on, on basing my opinions on solid science, and the problem is that the science is there, but we're not making use of it. Uh, so yes, weight regain is a worry. Barrett's esophagus uh, needs to be looked at more carefully. Great, thank you, uh, panelists. Uh, Aysam. Uh, yes, uh, actually, although Khaled, happy birthday, you won a lot of the debate, but uh, I think that the credit uh, really go to Alfredo. He was the one who um, raised the voice and shout to show where nobody dared to, take, uh, to talk about sleeve um, complications, and especially, especially reflux. So I think that he had a lot of credit in this. Uh, but for me, as a practitioner, it will not change a lot of my practice still. I will move for a better selection of my patient. I will counsel my patient, and I will do my uh, endoscopic surveillance. And this is how I read this debate. Thank you very much. Professor Musa. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, Hazim, uh, you've done a great job today. I had the honor to be with uh, among top expert people in the world to discuss this issue. But I think uh, it's important also to see the other point of view, as uh, Dr. Peterson mentioned before. There are people who, are, uh, who have see, shown uh, that reflux improves after sleep, and other people have uh, shown that it gets worse. I would uh, also to include in the beginning a neurons reduction, the Rebeki study, and this is uh, an, uh, a more objective study of the pH and manometry of people, uh, of patients who underwent to sleep gastrectomy. So I think uh, we need to look at the literature carefully. Yes, uh, Jenko's study uh, was one uh, of uh, the good studies that have taught us a lot in terms of long-term uh, development of Barrett uh, esophagus and reflux. However, we have to look at other uh, uh, the literature into more uh, depth. And I think the Rebecca study is uh, a, a, an objective study that shows us 
also the benefits of sleep gastrectomy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Musa, and for staying long. Uh, I know you're almost uh, going to break, break your fast. And thank you, Mufi, for staying throughout breaking your fast. I uh, would like to hear your closing remarks. Uh, Ahmed, Ahmed uh, all I need to say is... Uh, sorry. Sorry. So, Khalid, happy birthday. We didn't know thank it you. was your birthday, but you would have wished you much earlier. Uh, Ahmed, you've done a brilliant job as a moderator of this. I think you've brought out great points. All I need to say is that not the last word has been written or said about sleep gastrectomy and reflux with its chance of Barrett's esophagus or about weight regain. I just need to say that though sleep gastrectomy holds its pinnacle in the number of procedures being done worldwide right now, five years later, I think we might see something else rule the roost. Yeah, the future will, will tell us for sure. Uh, Chief, it's an honor to have you with us and yep. uh, we'd like to hear your opinion. Well, I, thank you very much. I, again, I appreciate uh, having been invited to this panel. I think it was a phenomenal uh, discussion today. Uh, and again, happy birthday to you, uh, Don. Um, uh, so I, I would say that uh, it is important for us to not dismiss what we've seen. Uh, and Dr. Jenko brings up a good point. There was an alarm bell sounded off, and I think it's important that we uh, evaluate that. I just think what we need to do is push this to uh, you know, a bigger study to really provide enough power for us to really um, you know, make some good decisions about what we should be doing. Because it's a scary thing. If this is the most uh, common operation we're doing worldwide uh, and uh, we're putting people at risk, I think we need to be aware of that. Um, and so uh, overall, uh, I, I say, I think a lot of us, again, go with our own personal bias and we see in our own practices. Uh, but I think it is certainly important that we give this the true uh, uh, focus that it's due um, and really come up with an answer. Uh, clearly, this was a, was a well designed study and it really uh, highlighted some points. But, uh, you know, it's hard for us when we have conflicting uh, data. When we have reports that say no, reports that say yes, um, I think we need to get something bigger so that we can really come up with a single a good answer uh, in, in the best way we can. So, so thank you all. Uh, uh, for Professor Jinko, uh, happy birthday, Khaled. Uh, Thank you for staying uh, through almost breaking your fast as well. And uh, uh, thank you, Haysam, Professor Musa, Mufi, Chief, uh, Hazan, and Manuela behind the scenes. It's been a pleasure. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you next month in the next webinar. And uh, thanks for everyone who stayed late with us. We're 30 minutes beyond the time allowed to us, but uh, it was an important discussion. And uh, uh, I had plenty of fun, so, so thank you. Ahmed, thank you. Uh, just, just a very quick word to Professor Jenko. Uh, I don't know whether you remember this or not, Professor Jenko. I visited your center in Rome about 15 years ago, and I still talk to people about the seven-course dinner. Seven-course dinner you took me out on. So you, are invited, you are invited the second time. You did his master, but you're always the master. You are invited. You all are invited in Roma, uh, in Roma, and uh, I thank you very much. It uh, be here with you discuss this topic. It was a, my great pleasure, and but it was my great honor, and uh, I thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.